and uh, thanks to the organizers for this meeting. So, uh, as you know, the organizers changed the talk from eight minutes to 15 minutes. So I had planned to actually <clears throat> give a short talk with not many results, but an idea that some of us have been working on. Uh, there is a high chance that this idea will collapse uh, by the time the next meeting comes around, but I'll still try to convey uh, some of the things that we have in mind. So this work, uh, you know, it's still work in process, so there are several people doing bits and pieces of this problem, and I'll explain what they're doing. And probably at the end of this meeting, more people will join the club, so that's why I have the dot dots there. Okay, so the question that we are trying to uh, tackle is uh, when one uh, typically tries to understand intermittency in turbulent flows, and this is something uh, from the 70s that people working in turbulence have been telling us that this is probably one of the key problems in such flows and what makes things uh, non-trivial and difficult to understand. And, uh, and it shows up in various ways, so this is the only sort of dense slide I have, but this is just a graphical illustration of what I mean. So for example, uh, the references have been sort of reasonably faithful, so they're all there. So for example, when people look at vorticity fields, you see you know, strong, intense patches which are immediately separated by very quiescent patches. Uh, when you look at uh, the way energy dissipates in flows, and you actually take a snapshot of where the dissipation structures are intense, you again see sort of structures which, um, you know, which doesn't make much sense from uh, various points of view. Uh, for example, if you look at, uh, and these are experimental data actually, uh, for example, if you calculate the PDF of acceleration of fluid particles, you find very fat tails, nowhere close to Gaussian, one doesn't really understand where these sort of large uh, extreme events are coming from. One can also look at particle trajectories. The color coding has to do with, you know, when you see a bright color, it means that the particle has really sped up all of a sudden. And, uh, and again, uh, you know, and, and then all of this can be sort of, I'll come back to this plot, can be encapsulated when one calculates what is commonly known, you know, anyone who does turbulence tends to show this picture, uh, what are known as the exponents for the structure function, and you see anomalous scaling. You see a straight line, which is due to Kolmogorov, the dimensional prediction, but all measurements seem to sort of go far from it. Uh, I will take one step further, and uh, because we've had a lot of talks and such systems, actually when one uh, calculates similar exponents for the Burgers equation, you know, you won't hear the word intermittency often associated with this, but I'll take that point of view, and I will say again, you see strong departures from dimensional scaling. We understand for the burgers why the bifractality comes around, but you'll see, soon see in a bit that it's a convenient picture to have in mind. So uh, historically, there have been, you know, I've sort of tried to be as fair as possible, at least to the reviews and to the newer work. Historically, people have tried to understand uh, intermittency, and uh, these have been sort of models which have been based on the velocity field or models which have been based on the nature of dissipation. These are phenomenological models. They are not sort of uh, microscopic derivations from the equations in any sense, but they're, you know, they're wonderful. They've, they've provided breakthroughs in the field right you know, from the 70s. Uh, and then came what are known as uh, the shell models, which is a toy model which seemed to reproduce, strangely enough, a lot of the features, the intermittent features, for example, the plot here, could be produced by such shell models. And finally, the sort of the massive breakthrough came in the 90s when people eventually had a theory for turbulence. I mean, I hope Rahul doesn't mind me saying that. And uh, that had to do with the Kreitzmann model, where you could actually calculate what these anomalous exponents were. They were within the framework of a sort of scalar field model, but you still had a theory to hold on to. Uh, and then, you know, but still that sort of didn't really explain the nature of intermittency in fluid turbulence. Um, recently, some of us have been sort of excited, maybe foolishly, by a new approach, and that's what I'm going to discuss a little, and that has to do with what we called uh, fractal decimation. And uh, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, the, the first sort of evidence came in this paper in 2012, it's somewhere here, uh, which used this approach for a completely different problem, 
but that sort of whetted the appetite for a lot of people to look at this. So this is the only sort of side with a lot of equations. So let me explain what we mean by our uh, by the mechanism uh, that we are going to use, and then I'll comment on the results and what they might mean. So what we essentially do, and uh, so the full reference is here with, uh, this was work with uh, Uriel, uh, Anna, Itamar, Focaccia, and myself, which is you take the equation in any integer dimension d, so this could be the Navier-Stokes, so b is the bilinear term, this could be Burgers, this could be, you know, your favorite equation, that's a linear term, and then one can define an operator PD, uh, which, you know, what, all that the operator does on the velocity field, once you expand it in a, on a Fourier basis, is to multiply a number theta k to each mode, where theta k has a prob is one with a certain probability and is zero with another probability. And, you know, carefully choosing, uh, the, uh, you know, what the scaling is of this h of k, and plugging this projector back into this equation, one can actually write down a decimated equation starting from the original small d dimensional system, and you can play around in any arbitrary dimension, dimension defined in this rather special sense of Fourier dimension. So all we are doing is to introduce a mask, a quench disorder, if you will, in our Fourier lattice, remove certain modes, both in the initial conditions and in the dynamics, and see how it evolves. Uh, let's see why uh, one, one finds this an interesting problem. Yes, sure. Sorry? That's right. So that's the project that I should have been careful with the notation here. Yeah, that's right. So this is the new field that you have, so I'm changing notation a little. Okay, good. So I won't go into why we sort of did this. Uh, this I discussed a couple of years ago in the same meeting. But uh, let's uh, get on with, you know, what are the new stuff that has come out of it. So let's try to play this game in the Burgers equation. Stupidly, let's do a numerical simulation, look at the data and see if we understand anything and if there's something interesting happening there. So in the simple sort of one-dimensional Burgers equation, this, the red line is the pure one-dimensional Burgers equation with the standard k minus 2 scaling. Now, when I, as I start reducing dimension, you will find that the slope of the energy spectrum becomes shallower. And here's a plot of what the energy spectrum slope is. And you see that very quickly, as you move away from d equal to 1, you come up with a scaling exponent of 3 halves. I'll give a little, you know, a hand-waving theory because it's a short talk to ex explain why it's 3 halves and why that's non-intermittent. Uh, similarly, you know, <clears throat> just to factor in finite Reynolds number effect, for a given dimension, we've looked at different Reynolds number, and we do see that the scaling sort of saturates to minus three halves instead of the usual minus two, the minute you have this sort of singular perturbation in terms of this quench disorder. Very good. So people typically, again, you know, structure function exponents are one of the nice measures of intermittency. So let's see what happens when you do that. So uh, I'll quickly come to love your stills, but this sort of, the ideas are fixed better in my view when one looks at the Burgers results, they're cleaner. So uh, for d equal to 1, if one looks at, if one measures the structure function exponent, one sees the usual bifractal, the bi-scaling behavior that everyone knows. Now, as I start reducing dimension, and these are at lower dimensions, uh, 0 0.95, 0 0.8, really, and that you see that these exponents now start falling on a single line which has a slope p by 4. It's well understood why it's p by 4. Towards the end, I'll comment on this. So this is a reasonable signature that certainly at the Burgers level, the singular perturbation on my field is doing something strange which makes the, uh, you know, the solution to those equations non-intermittent. One can actually even measure the kurtosis, which is a good measure of intermittency, and check what's happening. And again, you see, you know, if one looks at the slope, you see a singular behavior. The minute you go down from one, you quickly go on to another plane. And this, uh, you know, so, uh, okay, I have five minutes, so I, I, I won't try to explain this, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you can follow the prescription in uh, Beck and Kahnin's uh, physics reports for the Burgers uh, system, and one can actually come up with a reasonable analytical understanding of why this intermittency is lost, and in particular, why the slope is P by 4. Uh, I'll probably come back to this if we have time. 
Okay, good. So that's burgers where, uh, that was the explanation, so I'll come back to it in the end if there are questions. So that's burgers, but the important question is what's happening at Navier-Stokes, at the level of Navier-Stokes uh, equation. So uh, this is actually 2016, I'm sorry. So just a few months ago, uh, students of uh, Luca Bifarale, Roberto Benzi, and Alessandra, they did a wonderfully creative set of simulations using this prescription. And where they measured, for example, the distribution function of the vorticity field. When the dimension is three-dimensional, you again see these fat tails. As soon as the dimension is reduced, and there's an estimate coming from an older work of Robert and others, you see that the uh, distribution starts becoming Gaussian. And that feature is again uh, sort of uh, you know, well replicated in other measures of intermittent behavior. So the question really is the following, and this is where I would certainly love people's opinion, is we have introduced this quench disorder in the problem. As you've noticed that this HK is scale invariant, so it's a power law in K in the way the modes are being decimated. As soon as we start doing that, small scales seem to be affected in a way that we don't completely understand. And the best way to look at this is when, we, when one goes into the Lagrangian picture. So what one does, and uh, sort of these are, you know, there are two groups, we are not competing, we, are, we have sh shaken hands and we are working together now, is what happens is when we look at, uh, when we look at the energy spectrum, for example, for the three-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation, as you change dimension, and this is our theoretical prediction from the equations, uh, you see that they all sort of nicely follow the dimensional prediction the minute you turn on uh, decimation. And then when you start measuring these structure functions, so remember the, these are the Lagrangian structure functions, so you follow the trajectory of a particle, you had that image of the particle suddenly spinning around and moving faster. Now you've added, uh, you, you, you're sort of solving it on a decimated lattice, and now you want to calculate what are the exponents of these structure functions. So I plot here what are known as the local slopes. So, I mean, that, you know, wherever things are asymptotically flat, that's the value of, it, of your exponent, really. So this is what I'm plotting. And you see that as you change dimension and you start becoming, you know, lower in dimension, the effect of small-scale vortices, I mean, these dips are essentially when particles are getting trapped in these small structures, they tend to disappear, and slowly, the black line, you again come back to dimensional predictions. Sorry, I'm done. And, and so I would just like to conclude by saying that there is clear evidence and good theor theory in understanding why decimation kills intermittency in the Burgers equation. Um, the conjectures seem to go through to the Navier-Stokes. We still have a lot of calculations to finish, to check the theory, to check the numerics. And the perspective, and you know, since it's a status meeting, I'd like to highlight that this procedure can be applied to other problems. And the perspective is that hopefully this, uh, you know, this will lead to rather interesting conclusions in the coming years. So I, I think I really should stop here and take questions. Thank you. Are there questions? Yes. Uh, the distribution when you uh, the distribution you showed yeah. when you said fat tail you mean uh, the power law or the stress exponential laser? You mean the distribution the fat tails here? Yeah, yeah. These are uh, stress okay, so there is no. Uh, okay, so let me choose one theory. So if I want to explain it through the multifractal sort of formalism, then it's really a sum of exponentials. Now, if you were to do an experiment and measure a sum of exponential masks as a stretched exponential often and so there would be people saying that that's a stretched, ex certainly not a power law, but there would be people who say it's a stretched exponential, but that's just measuring. If you ask me, I would still go with sum of exponentials because the only model that I understand allows me that uh, prediction. But the data, yeah, you can fit stretched exponentials for sure. it over many realizations I mean uh, yeah so I, I, I skipped that bit in the interest of time and, uh, I mean so I'll give and yes so what you do is it's a quench disorder so in a given uh, for a given dynamics you ch don't change the disorder but you can make averages over disorder and there is a nice little 
theorem we have uh, written up, which shows you know, exactly your question for one mask or if you average over the various disorders. You find that some equality is also very nice. But again, burgers at the level of the theorem. So, uh, uh, Samriddhi. Just here, the yeah. rationales inside. Samriddhi. Yeah. I may have asked this question, I mean, sometimes back when you wrote your paper in 2012, okay, but still. So, when you construct the lattice, okay, and you say the lattice has dimension D, Essentially, what you're doing here, you're calculating the point-wise dimension of the lattice at the origin. That's right. So it's not the dimension of the lattice, it's the dimension of the lattice at that point. Uh, it's just a technical stuff. Yeah. So my question is, what if you create a lattice with the correlation dimension, D, and would the results change? Uh, the, if the question is, have I created? No. And if the, uh, the second question, would they change? I don't think so. But it's, it's, it's well worth looking at, because there's nowhere in the theory that we have where we use this fact. So there we just think, think in terms of degrees of freedom. Okay, we thank Shomrid again for his talk.